Welcome to this podcast, Holistic Creators, where we share our unique and universal stories about shaping the future for the four Ps, people, planet, purpose, and profit. My name is Manet Kunze. I'm a mental coach and your host of this show. My intention for this show is to inspire you on your path to a holistic future. So welcome. Welcome to my podcast, Holistic Creators. My name is Swanet and I'm your host. Today, I have a very nice guest. Her name is Louise, Louise Liebenberg. And she is an international best-selling author, transformational coach and counselor who specialized in adult child syndromes, self-esteem development, and transforma transforming unresolved grief. She loves taking long road trips with her husband, exploring new places on her motorbike, At home, she likes nothing better than writing her new book with three cats curled up on her, on her legs. She gets a creative outlet in doing stained glass and ceramics. Uh, as, your fearless, magnificent co no, as your fearless, magnificent counselor, she believes in your ability to shine, overcome, and transform your life and relationship. So please, welcome to my show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Swanit. Love, love being here. And I'm so glad I'm not the only one for a change with an accent. <laughs> so we already had the chance to speak a little bit before, but as my audience uh, doesn't know anything about you, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your own story, how you became the person who are you now? Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> well, um, basically, I, I'm one, like many people in the world, who had a dysfunctional upbringing. Mine is fairly easy to see. My father was an alcoholic. And then what happens is that the mother gives so much attention to the alcoholic that, they, that the children will always invariably fall through the cracks. And then you sort of have to grow yourself up. And um, that's, you know, that's the biggest part of my story. It's the part of the story that I could see. It's the part of the story that I could deal with. But the part of my story that I didn't know, which I didn't understand until much later, I had to go into therapy to understand it, is that I was rejected by my mother because um, she never bonded with me the same way she did with my brother. So I was my father's family. I wasn't her family. And it created... When you're small, you, you don't know that. You don't see that. You, you can't figure it out to yourself. You just know you're not as good as, and you are not good enough. But I never realized that part of my story. I realized the part about my father being an alcoholic. And it took me going through my life very determined to be successful and being successful and being in a relationship which was, was codependent and which worked until it stopped working before I became willing to look at myself in a different way. Because we don't know how much we are carrying with us because we learned it so young. So this is Muffin. <laughs> we, we learned it so very young, these lessons, before seven. That and, and, and squished away. So we don't always know what we are carrying with ourselves. And it's only when we start having problems. Um, and problems can be very simple. It can be procrastination. It can be over-controlling other people. It can be a fear of getting committed to any relationship. It can be perfectionism or any kind of too much too much of this or too much of that, or too little of this and too little of that. It's when we don't really have that balance in our life. It's still hard to see because we can be very, very successful human beings. We can be very successful in our careers. We can be very driven. In, in fact, that is a bit of a dead giveaway. Being very driven is, is, a, is a giveaway, but there's something pushing us. But we can be looking like really normal, nice people. We can learn what to say. We can learn how to fit in. And we can learn how to people please and how to be the version that the world wants us. But we lose ourselves inside. So my biggest blessing was when my codependently happy relationship disappeared. My husband turned 40. Um, he stopped drinking. And my husband was alcoholic, but he stopped drinking. And then he started drinking again. And um, then ADD, ADD was diagnosed 
And somehow after he turned 40, he started blaming me for his life. And he started being rejecting and punishing. And so our relationship fell completely apart. And because I put such a lot of my happiness in my relationship, I fell apart. So I was in the end completely roadkill. And that was my biggest blessing. Because the minute when I became roadkill from not having this man who was my support and, and helping me when I'm shy and I would hold on to him when I walk into a room of strangers because I was just socially really scared of people. Well, it was hard for me to make friends. So he went away. He, he stopped loving me didn't treat me nicely. He was completely disconnected from me. We still married, but he was completely disconnected from me. And when I became ready, when I said, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot do this to myself. I can't stay in this relationship. I can't be treated like that. I, 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 there must be more. It's the most amazing thing because then I found out about adult child syndrome. And adult child syndrome is exactly, you know, what I've described just now, where we have all these things that we learn in childhood. We take it with us. We believe in it. It's like the truth. We believe in it fully. We use that to get us as, uh, through our lives. But it holds us back in so many personal levels. And we don't know how to take better care of ourselves. So when I found, found the program, I wanted to just help one other person to please let it not be so hard because I've been to five psychologists and nobody could help me. Everybody had the best intentions. They really haven't been able to help me. They, you know, they, most people use the humanistic approach and it's like talk therapy and you walk out and you feel better and next week you come back and you still have the same problems and nothing has changed. So five psychologists later, many years of therapy later, no real changes. I... I finally found the adult child program. And when once I understood that, I really wanted to help other people. So I started volunteering at a psych psychiatric clinic and I started helping people. And it's from that desire that it mustn't be so hard for other people to find real effective help that I am now doing what I'm doing. Where I, I know from where I was, when it, where, where I was, so shy, so hard to... to, to to make friends where I can now get on top of a, a stage and I can talk to anybody. I don't care how many people. I can tell my story to anybody. I can empower and inspire other people because of my own story. And that's not even remotely the person I used to be. And if I can do it, then anybody can do that. I, I believe that so firmly. We can all learn to become present in our own lives and start making the changes that makes life easier and the relationships better. Yeah. So coming back to this point where you said um, being married to your husband, uh, you got this feeling now it is enough. Um, mm. What exactly happened there? Because I can see other women that are in, in uh, unhealthy relationships and they will never make the step to figure out that enough is enough. They, they are staying there because they are perhaps not uh, strong enough to step out or that they don't have help or what made you feel that now enough is enough and then stepping into the power and, and uh, to look at it and, and start your transformation? Yeah, you're asking the best question because this is really the best question. So what happened is I went through 12 years of really trying. So it was a psychologist and begging, pleading, fighting, crying, writing letters, all over again. Psychologist, begging, pleading, writing letters, crying. More or less the only thing that was, that was working was the crying and it helped for a day and a half. You know, I mean, we're back again. Being treated like I don't exist. Um, being, being spoken to like I am vermin. Like, or hardly even recognizing me. I'm part of the furniture. Like, are you sleeping next to your sister in this bed? What's going on? You know, why are you totally disregarding me? Before we had a really close relationship, even if it was codependent, I had a real loss. I lost the person who loved me unconditionally 
and accepted me unconditionally and suddenly I didn't have it. So my entire surety in my life went away when I didn't have this. It was an enormous loss for me. And I even spent two years in hopeless and helpless because when I've tried all these professionals and they couldn't help me, I, and I had only one conversation left. It was, he has to change and go back to where he was so that we can be happy. That was my full belief. Go back to where you were when you loved me so that we can be happy. I had no other ways. And after spending two years in helpless and hopeless, and that's a terrible thing. If you even spent three months of your life in helpless and hopeless, you can get cancer because your brain chemistry changes. So we need to know this. You can't go in helpless and hopeless and settle because you are harming yourself. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but you know what? Inside me, I woke up one morning. It was four o'clock in the morning couldn't sleep again. Again, after so many nights of waking up and crying into my pillow, and crying, night after night after night, crying myself to sleep, waking up and feeling desperate. That morning at four o'clock, I got up, and a voice inside me said, Louise, you cannot do this to yourself one more day. If you keep on doing this to yourself, you're going to get sick. You are, something's going to happen to you. You're going to get some sort of sickness that you won't be able to reverse. I don't know where that came from. I had no idea about how the body-mind connection worked. But I just had a little voice inside me saying, stop doing this to yourself. I didn't know how. I didn't know where to go next. I just knew I had to stop it. I had to do something different. That's the moment when I knew I couldn't wait for him anymore. I couldn't wait for another person anymore. I had to stop it. And it was a magical moment because then I actually went and I woke him up. It was half past four. I woke him up. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. We are deciding how we're going to get divorced today. Not more. No more. We can't get divorced because of. Or if this happens, we'll stay mad. No more of that. I'm done. Now, this was the time when he started working on himself. This was still a whole lot of trauma and throwing things around and him drinking and huge explosions before he started working on himself. And I, I found the adult child program and where I could actually start working on me and let him be, you know, work on yourself. Don't work on yourself. It is my turn. That is the magical phrase where you finally realize you are your own responsibility. You are the one that has to say, I have had enough. I'm ready. I am changing something. I'm not waiting for somebody else. Yeah, exactly. So this is really from inside out. So you have to start healing yourself, making the change inside of yourself, and then you will see that also the, your environment will change. Now it's like a kind of a mobile. If you change one part, the other one need to adjust. So uh, of course, other people around you will recognize that you change your personality, that you get stronger, that you make different um, uh, uh, decisions, and so they have to to yeah move as well, or they have to leave. This is the other option, of course. Yeah. Yes. It, yeah. It it is. Absolutely that. When you change, when you, and change is very specific. It is, first of all, to put yourself first in your queue. You, you, if you don't do that, you're not changing. You have to put yourself first. And then start applying self-care and self-love and acceptance. Well, build yourself. Build yourself up. That's your main job because you wouldn't have ended up in a relationship like that, in a situation like that, where you are not valued if you valued yourself. We always end up in these relationships because of the way that we teach other people it is okay to treat us. And we do that because we don't value ourselves enough. We think we do, but look at how we let other people treat us from the first moment. And why? And why do we do that? We do it for that same reason that I did it for. Somebody loved you unconditionally and made you feel special and accepted, even if it was for five minutes. And we love that so much. It is so great for us to have that person 
who loves us unconditionally and make us feel so special that we will stay in bad relationships for the hope that maybe it will come back. That is so part of the adult child syndrome of anybody who grew up with dysfunction, with trauma in their life, that we will do that. We don't understand that because you know what? I'm an intelligent woman. I am a go-getter. I am successful in loads of things. I've got so many talents. And I'm sitting here in this situation waiting for a man to change. But even at the stage, I'm like, what's wrong with you, Louise? Why are you doing this? I couldn't understand it. So it wasn't like I couldn't do something else. It wasn't like I didn't know my abilities. But there was a deep level of me not knowing that I was lovable and likable and wanted. And I stayed in a relationship. I don't, you know, waiting. So we have to start by loving ourselves. We have to put ourselves first in the queue. We have to apply self-care, self-love. Yeah, so I think this is something very um, special that the audience also needs uh, to understand, that look at how people treat you, what this makes with you, like what are the feelings that come up, what, what are the beliefs that come with up, and what is it that you are really longing for, what is, is that you really wish to have in your life. And if you look into the mirror and figure this out, This is already the first step to, to start the transformation, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is true. Like, the, like I said before, we teach people how to treat us. If they are treating us in a certain way that doesn't work for us, it's because of that first time we didn't have a boundary. It's because of that first time when we didn't go like, ah, ah, you think you can speak to me like that? Because it's never... 10 years in three children later, it's always right in the beginning. Even before we get married or get into a relationship, we can already start seeing it and we forgive people and we believe we shouldn't be difficult and don't be, you know, don't be a spoil sport. And um, I want to be liked and I don't want to be lonely and I don't want to be the only one showing up as without a date you know so we settle and we settle and we settle and we don't expect of the people that we date the people our friends even our friends our family to show up better for us we don't know that we can ask them to show up better and that we don't have to settle for this we we settle for this mm. so it is On the one hand, understanding how people show up to us, but what you said also, setting boundaries and communicate that a certain behavior uh, is, is not okay for us. And then uh, really start doing our inner work, like understanding what were uh, like um, the situations in our childhood uh, that uh, yeah started our beliefs about ourselves. And um, can you go a little bit deeper into what you figured out Uh, about yourself uh, when you started with your own transformation? Okay, so what I what I have already given a few hints here. So I didn't know that I wasn't good enough. Now, there's a not good enough epidemic in this world. It's, it's so many people do not know that they're good enough. You know, we are so good on the other side. We are so good to say, don't be full of yourself. And, you know, don't boast. Be a nice girl, especially women. Get trained to be a nice girl. You know, don't be difficult. Instead, what we don't say is you are unique and you are special and go out and shine. Go out and shine. We don't say that. So here we are, we're not shining, we don't believe in ourselves. And then if we had a problem with bonding with a parent, or if some sort of traumatic thing in our lives happened before six, then we, we make it about us. We believe, we caused it. But up to seven, we believe. If we were better, it would be better. So I um, honestly didn't know I was lovable. <laughs> didn't know... I was lovable. And a lot of people walk around with that one where you feel I've got to put these big, big walls up around me and I cannot let people into the inner 
sanctuary easily because if they really getting to know me, they are not going to like me. Now, I've had a very interesting experience in the last few months where I, I don't have those beliefs anymore. I know I'm likable. I know I'm lovable. I have an amazing circle of people around me. I, I know I can make friends easily. I know that I pull people to me. It's all amazing stuff. But an, a new person that I met fairly recently in the last five, six months, um, not really pursuing a friendship with me. And I actually got myself thinking this week, like, oh, she actually likes me that much. Like, such an old belief system that automatically popped up. I don't even know where it came from. Why, why I even have to give, but it's such an old belief system. It's from the time when the old Louise were around, from when I had to, I made people work so hard over and over and over to show me you really want to be friends with me before I let them in a little bit just a little bit until I was really sure I can trust you and then more and more and more now my my safety is in a different place my safety is now in me I can trust me therefore anybody is welcome come on in be my friend I be my best friend. I have many best friends. I, I will love you and accept you and you. And, and if anything goes wrong, I will put boundaries because my boundaries are strong. So I don't have to let you in carefully anymore. I have to love and trust myself. And I have to know that I have got access to boundaries. So that whole belief system, that I didn't have that belief system. I didn't know that I was lovable and I didn't know that I could let anybody in and still be safe. I, honestly, if somebody wants to go and break confident stuff, you know, you have shown me you're not such a, bit, a trustworthy person as I thought. That's fine. It doesn't kill me. You can, you're still welcome. Now, we've got all these limiting ideas about who can we let, let into our lives and who are safe. And when you find your safety in yourself and you realize that other people's opinions doesn't count, and that you, you don't have to be worried about who comes in. They're not going to see anything rotten inside you because you were not born rotten. And if they do anything that's out of line, boundary, have a conversation. That's all. It's actually very simple. Hmm. So what I also understand is that uh, before you worked on yourself, there was like um, this there was a kind of a boundary around you because you said like I only let people in a little bit and step by step so somehow you had a boundary that said uh, if I open myself I will get hurt or people will reject me so you don't, didn't even open up so it, it was uh, another boundary and not really a helpful one so now yeah, it was a wall hmm? it was a wall it was a wall it wasn't thin and flimsy It was one big high wall and you had to work to get in, you know, which is what a lot of people do. Yeah, of course, if on the one hand, if they are open and then um, accept uh, that people love them and come close. And if they are open, of course, they will feel uh, the same time again when they are rejected this amount of pain. So It's like uh, also balancing uh, the, the emotions. No? Um, how how do, are you doing this? As you now say, yeah, um, you feel safe inside yourself. You worked on, on your, your blocking beliefs and you set the boundary that is not the, the high wall anymore. How do you handle that uh, if people reject you now? or um, if yeah, The fear of the pain. Yeah, yeah the fear, fear of the pain. Um, I've gone away from the fear of a pain. I now accept that some people will disappoint me, but they, that won't decimate me. Like I say, if I have a friend and that a lot of us are really worried about people talking behind our backs or betraying our confidence, that's one of the big things with friends. If that happens, I have accepted that my friends are not going to be perfect. Some of them are going to be more loyal. Some are going to be less loyal. It doesn't matter. There's like literally nothing a friend can do that will completely decimate me. 
if somebody breaks a confidence, I would say the next time, I'm not going to share confidences with you anymore. Because that I really didn't want spread around. And you did. So I'm a little bit more careful about it. I'm not going to hate him. I'm not going to take it personally. I'm just going to change my attitude and, and park them in the, you are not a very um, uh, reliable person that I can tell this to. Uh, on the subject of reliable, if somebody said, yes, of course, I'll do it for you, and they don't, I'm not going to be decimated by it. I am going to make sure that next time I'm asking a more reliable person. So because people are humans, and sometimes when somebody's not reliable, it's not about me. It's not because I'm not important. It's sometimes it's because they had flu, or they, you know, they got busy, or something really bad happened in their life, or they had a, you know, a flat tire, whatever, you know. So we make it about ourselves. That is why we are so offended. When we stop making it about ourselves, then we are not offended. What's that? My cat is snoring. <laughs> hey, Twelftail. Sorry about that. Strange noises here. <laughs> so I've got a big fat cat and he's snoring. So if we make anything about ourselves, we are offended. If I say my friend is not a perfect human being, she's still welcome. I'm just, I'm just adjusting my boundaries around her. I'm willing to have conversations if something is very important to me. So we adjust our expectations, but not everybody has to be perfect. Stuff is going to happen, and we then become willing to talk about the stuff that's, that's non-negotiable, and we. And we don't make anything about ourselves. And that way you manage to get yourself through all kinds of situations with people because people are fallible and people are human and stuff happens. So it's just changing the expectations and how you react to it. So it really is learning how to manage yourself in a difficult world. The world is not that easy that things are not going to happen. We have to learn to manage ourselves. But at the same time, you know, if anything ever happens again, like it did when the time when I was roadkill and I fell apart, I will still hurt the same. I will definitely still hurt the same. I will still mourn. It will still be hard for me. It will still be upsetting. But I will never be roadkill again because I have found myself. And the reason I was roadkill is because I didn't have myself. I have always lived for somebody else. I've never had that love and appreciation for myself and I've never learned how to, how to validate myself and how to celebrate myself and see myself as my own strength. I, I put it on somebody else. So roadkill will not happen again. But sadness may and upset may. But devastated? No. Just normal grief, which is fine because that's normal. Okay, so um, how was your process? So you said you have been in therapies before and then you uh, came uh, to some teachings about how to heal the inner child. Can you talk a little bit more about this process and, and the teachings behind? Sure. So I'm a, I trained as a counselor and a, co and a coach. So I call myself a coacheller because I don't just do counseling. I also coach people to understand how to use their new tools because if we had parents like my mother who was preoccupied with my father because he's an alcoholic so she's just trying to keep life normal you know keep the children quiet don't upset the man we don't want any reason for him to drink we don't want any fights um he's not arriving home tonight i'm pretending everything is normal you know like keeping that that normal look that, that we do so and preoccupied with what's going to happen. Is there going to be another fight? So the children always know something is not right. They always pick up from their mother. So we can't really, we can't, we can't get away from any dysfunction when we grow up. But what we do is we, we've got an internal language and a belief system and a, a certain set of tools, it's not even tools, just behaviors which gets us to adult. And these behaviors don't work when we are adults. Now, bear in mind, 70 to 80% at minimum of the world have adult child syndrome, but we just don't know it because we're so good with looking okay. 
And it's only when we start getting into trouble that these come out very often in our relationships. So I'm a relationship counselor because that's where adult child syndrome comes out. And also an addiction, uh, one of the big things is addiction. So, um, or in overreactivity, so a lot of uh, borderline personality disorder uh, patients are, actually have adult child syndrome. And it, it's very effective for, to do this work with them. So if I start working with somebody, I help them give them those tools that their parents didn't give them. But their parents, for whatever reason, um, came from a place of generational trauma, or they had difficult times in their lives, even although they were great people, wonderful people, morally upright people, but for some reason, they didn't have the tools to give to their children. And this is the majority of the world. Really well-meaning people, but the children just fall through the cracks. So I help them to understand their trauma, their own trauma, their generational trauma, understand why they are walking around with a seven years old outlook on world, why it's not working, and then I help them find the tools. I literally teach them how to communicate better, how to believe in themselves. So build self-esteem, build communication skills, help them neutralize the triggers, you know, the overreactions, and help them learn how to get their emotions to even. And then they become empowered adults, individuals who are present in their own life. And they can suddenly communicate in a way that other people will hear them. And they can then be effective in their own circle. Not one woman influences at least 16 people in her circle. That's why I love working with women. Okay, so how, how can this happen when, for example, I, I'm grown up um, being not really recognized and therefore I have a, a low self-esteem and I, I'm now grown up and still have these, this kind of, of belief about myself. And of course, there will always be triggers outside that confirm my belief about myself. So how can I transform that? How is it possible? Okay, so look, we always start with self-worth. We, we always have to first know that we are not different from anybody else in the world, that we have been born worthy. I always, I'm, I've got a four-day program for people, a self-worth program. And I like literally try and get everybody on it. Because once you've been on the self-worth program, something in you changes forever. So self-worth is the most important thing. So when you know you are worthy, you treat yourself differently. And when you know you are worthy, you tolerate much less rubbish. And when you know you are worthy, you expect of other people to treat you better. If you don't know that you are worthy, you're going to let people walk over you. You are not going to believe that you can use a boundary and people will still love you. You, you will not want to use boundaries because you're going to believe I'm not worthy. People will leave me if I use boundaries. So we start with self-worth. When I say to you self-worth, I'm saying to you, look at a room full of babies. Put yourself in the middle of that room. And then you tell me, how were you not born worthy like all of those other ones? Every little one in that room were born worthy, you included. That's like the first major mindset change that anybody can make in three minutes. How were you not born exactly as worthy as anybody else? That's the first one. The second one is check how you treat yourself. Check your own internal language. That is the easiest change to make of all the changes. Stop talking to yourself in a harsh way. Stop the negative self-talk. Start talking to yourself like you are your own best friend, like you talk to your best friend. Of course, you're going to do amazing at this. Of course, Louise, you're going to do well with this. Of course, believe in yourself. You're going to do so amazing. So you have to start looking at yourself and talking to yourself like this. You have to stop saying, you idiot, or, 
you know, what the hell what were you thinking? You have to start saying, everybody makes mistakes, try again. Or, of course, you know how to do this. And it doesn't make it matter if you make a mistake. We learn through our mistakes. The way you speak to somebody else is the way you're supposed to speak to yourself. And this is really, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but this is really interesting to, uh, if, if uh, you ask people what they tell themselves, to write it down and speak these words to another person, they would say, I would never do that. Yeah, exactly. this is, yeah, th yeah. This is, is so harsh. And, and yeah, uh, but you're speaking these words to yourself. So yeah. becoming aware of what is your self-talk and then, yeah, uh, changing it, reframing it, using other words uh, is so important uh, to uh, get also another feeling about yourself. It's not only that you need to do this uh, like uh, in, in the behavioral way, but also understanding what the words have, words always have a meaning. And yeah, yeah with this meaning they transport or that they trigger emotions. And this is, I think, also really important uh, that you can make this kind of change with, with your own emotions by yeah, speaking can. differently to yourself, yeah. You can do this without ever seeing any counselor. You can start today to build yourself by just refusing to talk to, to yourself, like you say, in a way that you wouldn't say out loud to another human being. But we go one step further. We actually say these nasty things out loud to ourselves. And our subconscious believes everything we say. Our subconscious has no other way than to believe what we're saying. So if we go one step further and we start saying wonderful things to ourselves, positive things to ourselves, of course you can do this. Or I, I do better when I know better. That's Maya Angelou. You know? So I, I, of course, everybody makes mistakes. I am not the same as all those little ones. In the, in, everybody makes mistakes. And who wants to be perfect anymore? You know, let's drop this perfect nonsense. There's such a lot of perfect nonsense going on in the world. Who wants to be perfect? I'm not perfect. Nobody else is perfect. Be a little bit kinder on yourself. That it's important to say these things out loud so your subconscious can catch up and start changing how it thinks. It's been thinking for you since you were seven years old in harsh terms. Give it something else. Say it out loud. That's how affirmations work. And that's why affirmations actually work because your subconscious will believe you. And then take it one step further. Like that's step three, one step further. And what you do is this. You don't only stop a negative talk. You also start to treat yourself like you would treat your best friend. I have people who have said to me, you know, I've been scared of coming to you or any counselor because I really believe that I have to get better before I can go to somebody because somebody's going to lock me away. If they know the help, messed up I am inside. I believe there are lots of people who are trying to get better before we go see somebody because they are so scared that somebody will see their insights and say, you're beyond help. There's no such thing. Bring us your messiness. Bring us, bring, bring us your problems because underneath all that messiness, you were being born worthy. You are amazing. You're the only one who can be you. Nobody has to get better at anything. I first have... I first have to lose 50 Ks before I go to the gym. Like, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. I first have to drink five liters of water before I go see the doctor. That, that's that kind of thinking where we put all these limits on myself. I can like myself when I am better at. I will like myself when I don't scream at anyone. I will like myself if I pass this test. Yeah, that's rubbish. Start liking yourself today. Not when I. And that's one of our most debil debilitating things that we do. I will like myself when. Uh -uh. Like yourself, full stop today, because you're the only one who can be you. That, you can't get past it. You're the only one who can be you. And nobody is perfect. We're all full of flaws. It doesn't matter. And here's the example. Think about your friends, the ones you like. Who of them are without flaws? You still like them. Befriend yourself and do the same for yourself. 
Yeah, so exactly. So we, we already have three steps. Is there anything else that people can do? So um, like uh, treating themselves as they are already the perfect ones for themselves. And this is not perfect like the schedule someone else has, but for themselves, how they want to be. And from there on, of course, they can always become better or, or not for that but for their own definition yeah, yeah. and um, I think this is also something like who is putting the scale uh, often we have this idea that our social system is setting the scale of how we should be for being perfect mm -hmm. or for being good or for being liked but this is our own scale we, we can put on us and uh, I, I'm a fan of, of uh, personal development and in spiritual growth so I don't uh, put the scale from other people on me, but the one uh, of myself. So, you know, how can I become better for myself and for the world every day? And it is step by step by step, but it is not that I have to be the, the super perfect one, but I want to be a little bit more better, uh, more supportive from, for myself and for the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say the next step is to apply self-care. Yeah. And to go make the list for you, what it means, what self-care means. It, it, it may mean actually going to the doctor's appointment. It may mean going to a spa. It may mean you go and buy yourself something pretty. It may mean that you take a full hour of lunch, which is what I do. You know, not 15 minutes or five minutes or don't eat anymore. I take an hour of lunch because I do it for me. Because it's important to me. And it's good for me. So... Those little things that you do for yourself changes more about how you value yourself than thinking it. When you start bringing action, self-care actions into your life, and you do it because you know you are important to you, you change something amazingly big about your outlook and your system. So it starts with that, bringing the self-care in. But the thing which I think is one of the most transformational things is to become very real and to to be who you really are, you know, to just show up. This is who I am. You know, I am here. I have wrinkles. Um, I don't, tonight I don't have my perfect top on. I normally have a perfect top on, high starch points, and it's like also professional. But, you know, tonight is just tonight. And me not wearing the top that I always like to wear doesn't take away from my message. My message is important. I'm real. I'm here. I'm a person. You can relate to me. That's good enough for me. I don't have to be perfect in order to make a difference in the world, in order to connect with people. I could just show up and be me. And I've really seen that the more I am just me, the more I attract the right people, and the more I have people gravitating, the right people gravitating towards me, the right people, my tribe. I. I attack the right people when I stop trying to fit into the world, but when I am unashamedly me. And we are scared of that. We are very, very scared of being real, of being me. And when we drop that and we just show up, you know, like that, that saying always goes, like a four-year-old in a Batman cape, you know. I'm here. So I like literally want everybody to put on their Batman capes and go like always superwoman capes or well, I don't like superwoman. She works too hard. And just going like, I am here. I am here. You know, that is what the world needs of us. Our world, the world needs our unique viewpoints, our unique way of doing things, our input into any project. Otherwise, we're not bringing our part. Our own unique talents. Our, our who we really are is what makes the world better. Being like everybody else you know, doesn't make anything different in the world. It doesn't change. It doesn't make anything better. Just fitting in. Yes. Who we are is yes. important. Yeah, exactly. So um, one thing you said uh, is like you first have to uh, take care of yourself. And this is what, you now if you have uh, an accident with an airplane, they always tell you, First, no, take the mask with the oxygen, help yourself, and then start helping the other ones. So you need to be in your own power. Then you are the one that is strong that can help the other ones. 
And it is often that the ones that are helping uh, other people a lot don't help themselves. So it is like, you no, know, help first of all you. If you are strong, if you are in your power, if you are healed, then you, are, you have such a potential to have a lot of other people around you. And therefore, of course, being authentic, being your true self, like knowing about your potentials, about your gifts, about your values as well, understanding who are you and show up with your own on truth and with your authenticity. I think this is also very important, yeah. It's, it's true. People are often very worried about coming across as selfish when you say put yourself first. But I like to say, you want to be like Oprah and have a lot to give everybody else? Have you checked? Have you noticed how excellently well Oprah takes care of herself? She takes excellent care of herself. And, 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 and that's the reason she has so much to give to people. Because if you are empty, you've got nothing to give to people. So I say to people, be like Oprah. Stop this, stop this false modesty story and not putting yourself first. Stop, stop that story. It's not working. I mean, you've tried it for a long time. Stop doing it. Start taking care of you and you'll be so replenished, replenished that you will have a lot to give to other people. I have a kind of outlook and it's amazing. Yeah, I think this is especially also a teaching for, for women that um, no, at the beginning you said no, um, they are educated, like you need to be nice and you don't put yourself first and you need to help other people. This is a kind of mindset that is still in um, a lot of, of uh, societies. And of course it is about helping other people and being social, but you can't bring out your full potential if you don't take care of yourself first. And this is not egoistic or selfish. Uh, this is for, for everybody, yeah? Now, taking care of yourself doesn't mean that you don't care for others. Taking care of yourself doesn't mean that you don't have good manners, that you're not considerate. It doesn't mean any of that. Taking care of yourself means something else. It means I take responsibility for me because it's my job. It's nobody else's job to take responsibility for me and my happiness and my, my wants and needs. It is my job. I can still be all these other people. I can still help people. I can still support people. But now I can do it without harming me. Because in the past, we would be so people-pleasing and so involved in everybody else's business that there was this like no place for ourselves. And once we start having a place for ourselves, we don't become depleted. We have more to give. But we're do, not doing it from a place that I have to do this because I believe it, or I have to do it because it's the only way I feel better about myself. We now do it from a place of I am so full. I'm so filled up with self-love and from taking care of myself. But I have so much to give to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree to what you are saying. So if um, the people that uh, listen to uh, our conversation are now interested to come in contact with you, how is this possible? Do we have a website, social media or something that you would like to share? Yes, I've, um, you've got my link, um, which is, um, so you've got all my links. At, it's Louise V. in Liebenberg. And um, my website is Infinite Potential. It's, it's I-infinite. So it's better if you go and click on the link because it's, it's quite confusing. So because I believe in everybody's in potential. Everybody has got that infinite potential. But the, the, the gift that I'm giving, especially for your audience, is that everybody who completes the form, which is about your unresolved hurts. So there's a form for you to complete about your unresolved forms, um, unresolved hurts that you know somehow you're carrying it with you. Everybody who completes it must just write for me in the comments, Swanet. And if, because I pull a certain amount of people every month and I have a conversation with them. And for your audience, I will have a conversation with everyone. They must just put in the comments for me. 
and I will talk to you. And we can talk about what it is that you're hiding and, and underneath, what is, what is still the right direct in your life, and some really great ideas of next future steps on what to do. So I'm very happy to do that for your audience. Wow, what an amazing gift. So I will put the links in the description so that people can easily reach out to you and fill out the form and enter the comments one at and uh, take the chance to speak with you and yeah, get the first ideas about what uh, is in, in them and how they can yeah, go into the potential and, and change their lives. Thank you so much for that. It's so. a big pleasure. I, mean, I also have on YouTube, I have a lot of live, live um, coachings. I do a live coaching on, on Facebook and YouTube every single week. It's there. It's for free. Anybody can go on there and go and learn more about this stuff that we carry with us and we don't have to carry it about ourselves with us and we can become fully empowered if, we, if, we have, if we're still carrying that with us. Okay, so I will also put the link to the, your YouTube channel in the description and so this is really already a lot of help for, for my audience. And thank you so much for being my guest on this show today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening or watching my podcast, Holistic Creators. If you want to know more about how I can help and support you, have a look at my website, spiritualchangemaker.com. You can also join my Facebook group, Spiritual Change Makers Community. Stay tuned for the next episode by subscribing to this channel. And you also can check the previous episode.